My name is Betsy Crockin, and if you can look up above, you will see my partner, Rachel Feigenbaum, who can wait, wait to get, oh, sorry. <laughs> We're pleased to be here today on behalf of the Holocaust Commission of the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater. Our purpose in coming to see you and other schools is to help young people understand the consequences of hatred prejudice, and discrimination. Often what begins with ugly words turns into ugly actions and eventually has ugly consequences. We hope that after you hear this story, you will speak up even if others around you are not. Let this personal account of a single Jewish survivor of the Holocaust inspire you to become engaged in your school community and to prevent this type of tragedy from happening anywhere to anyone ever again. The survivor stories that I'm, the one I'm going to share with you, and actually all of them occurred over 70 years ago. Seems like a very long time. But sadly, in the last few years, we've seen many instances of genocide. There is no better way to learn about the Holocaust than from the survivors because they are the ones who witnessed this genocide. And although each one has a very different story, they all have a common thread, a personal struggle that involved courage, grit, luck, they all had the help of at least one righteous Gentile, a non-Jew, that led to their survival. Each of their stories had another common bond. It all began with a jolt from normalcy. Just imagine if you were sitting at your breakfast table and you read the newspaper and it says that beginning tomorrow, all people who are Protestant in Chesapeake are no longer going to be citizens. Can you imagine how you would feel? Often, in the face of immediate danger, there was very little time for people to pack anything that belonged to them, even to know what to pack. So they, what they took was what little they could carry, which is why we call this program What We Carry. In many instances, even the very few possessions they took were lost along the way. Remember, they traveled on foot, in trains, into concentration camps. They, they traveled all over Europe. And in many, many cases, the few things they had were lost. Can you imagine surviving and being, let's say, the only one in your family to survive and not having a picture of your family? So we hope that after you hear about Hans today, that you will apply the lessons you learn to the decisions you make every day in your lives. Will you stand up against the bully, or will you take the path of least resistance and do nothing? Will you judge everyone on their merits, or rather on their race, their religion, their ethnic origin? Will you stand up for justice? If you do, you will be honoring the memory of those who perished, as well as the survivors who spoke, so that this could never happen again. In 1933, the Jewish population of Europe stood at over nine million. Just to give you an idea of what nine million people stand for, how many people do you think live in the state of Virginia? Anybody have an idea? Eight and a half million. So more people than live in the state lived in your Jewish people lived in Europe. Twelve years later, two out of three had been murdered. First-hand accounts of this period are the best way we have to understand how this tragedy could occur. Hans Lohenbach was a survivor of the Holocaust and the man whose story I'll present today. Hans passed away 
in 2012, he was 96, he was a very dear friend of mine, and he spoke to thousands of students like you all over the area, as well as people in the military. As Hans put it, he had the bad luck of being born in Germany in 1915. After returning home from fighting for Germany during World War I, Hans's father, Louis, settled the family in Lübeck, Germany. Louis was a successful businessman who owned department stores. However, despite Hans's comfortable home life, he was often the target of rising anti-Jewish sentiment at school, even before Hitler took power. My name is Hans Lohenbach. My life before Hitler was the same way like any other German boy. My parents were the typical German Jews who were so assimilated that in my house we had Christmas and not the Jewish holidays. When I entered high school, my troubles started. Our history teacher explained that part of the fault that Germany had lost the war was due to the international Jews. So I was beaten up by 10 boys for three days without interruption, saying even that it was my fault that they had lost the war. Not that everybody hated me, but they did not help me when the 10 boys were hitting me up. This was my life. So all what I could do is just work hard and make sure when I get out of high school to go into college. Heil! 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 1933, as soon as Hitler came to power in January, Jews who was employed by the German government were thrown out of their job. They burned all the Jewish books from Jewish writers. They took them out of the libraries and threw them on the street. And on 1st of April, there were two uniformed Nazis with policemen standing in front of every Jewish store with a sign, German don't buy from Jews. The terrible thing for me was that I was not anymore allowed to go to college. All my dreams were shattered. You all know what a boycott is. The April 1933 boycott that Hans speaks of targeting Jewish businesses and professionals made it difficult for German Jews to make a living. Hans's father became keenly aware of this and he knew that they needed to be careful. So they moved from Lübeck, which was a very small town, to Berlin where they felt they could be live more anonymously. Since Lü um, but everybody, everybody in, in obviously in Lübeck knew the Lohenbachs, but they were not inconspicuous in Berlin because Hans's father owned a, a chain of department stores. And because of this, Hans was targeted again. When the Nazis boycotted all the Jewish businesses, um, it meant that they would not allow Hans's father to be one of the three partners of the, of the um, department stores. So they wanted to force Hans to give his share to his non-Jewish partners, but Hans refused to do that. So they sent him to Buchenwald. And I think pretty soon you will see how that happened. So his father was stripped of his livelihood in an effort to, to 
to uh, deprive all the Jewish people of being able to make a livelihood, just as Hans was stripped of his dream of going to college. We were sitting at the dinner table, and there was a terrible knock at the door. Two uniformed SS men came with policemen and ordered my father to come to the police quarters. He has to clear something up. So my father went and didn't come back. Half a year later, we heard that he was still alive in the concentration camp Buchenwald. Nineteen thirty-five, I got an order to come to be recruited to the German army. I could be for the army, for the navy, or for the air force. The old doctor told me, you will join our army. Are you not happy? Da kommen der deutsche Mensch, wird nicht nur ein Mensch des Buches. A day before, the propaganda minister Goebbels spoke over the radio. Eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. Don't tell us, Jews, are also human beings. Lies are also animals. So having this still in my ears, I told this doctor, look, I will not join the German army. And he said to me, with us it's different. That is what he believed. Two months later, they came took my passport and put in it Abstammung, which meant Jewish. Hans's father actually was picked up in 1934, where he showed you he heard the knocking on the door when they were having dinner. That was actually before the Nuremberg Laws were even announced. So you see how early it had started. By 1935, the Nazis announced the Nuremberg Laws, which stripped Jews of their German citizenship. If you were stripped of your American citizenship, you would no longer be protected by an American policeman or have anything, any privilege that comes to you because you were an American. It also, this Nuremberg Laws made it impossible for Jewish lawyers. They couldn't enter courthouses. Doctors could not treat non-Jewish patients. Jews were not allowed to ride in streetcars or sit on park benches, go to theaters, restaurants, rent movies, etc. Under these laws, and with his father in a concentration camp, life was becoming increasingly uncertain for Hans and his mother. They had no business, right? The father's business had been taken away. So his mother rented out rooms in their house in order for them to have enough money to eat. Hans was a gifted athlete, as well as a very bright student, and he was a talented swimmer. So he had a great interest in the Olympic Games. This was 1936, and they were coming to his home city of Berlin. With the Nuremberg Laws now barring Jews from participating in Germ German life, the International Olympic Committee put pressure on the Nazi government not to promote discrimination. Hitler's government feared that the, the laws, the games, might be pulled from Berlin, so they eased the enforcement of the anti-Jewish laws. As a result, instead of bringing worldwide attention to what was really happening in Germany, it all got whitewashed. And 
even though, even though it was happening right then and there, uh, the violence against Jews, it was on the rise, but the rest of the world wasn't aware of it. In 1936, the famous Olympiad came along. I took a lot of foreigners to the Olympiad and translated it. And I saw with my own eyes how Jesse Owens won five gold medals. And I saw that Hitler gave everybody the hand who made a gold medal, but he didn't give Jesse Owens the hand. I learned very fast that he not only hated Jews, but he was also a race hater. Nineteen thirty-seven. I get a letter from the police department to pick my father up. This was all I was waiting for. When I came to the police department, I saw that I had made a mistake. 10 Jewish boys my age were standing there. Then he was put on an open truck and went to the main police quarters. I knew that the truck had to stop, and I used that moment to jump the truck. And from that moment on, I lived illegal in Germany. From morning to evening, I rode on the subway, on the bus, on the train, whatever was moving, making as if I'm busy like anybody else during daytime. Every night I had to sleep somewhere else. I would not dare to sleep twice in the same place. I felt like a deer and it was deer season. Anybody could have shot me. Even though World War II had not yet begun, Hans found himself in a very dangerous situation. At this point in time, the German security police run by the Gestapo and the criminal police were free to detain and imprison anybody they chose. They were their own watchdogs, creating an impossible situation for anyone that they had any reason, valid or not, to arrest. In this environment, if he were caught, Hans would have immediately been sent to one of Germany's concentration camps. He needed to get out of Germany, but in order to get out, one has to have a passport. He would have to live, leave illegally, because he, remember, he, didn't, he no longer had a German passport. When all else failed, he, because he was such a strong swimmer, he attempted an escape that few others could have tried. I tried to cross the border of Switzerland. And I tried Holland. I was not able. So I figured out that I will try to cross the border from Germany to Denmark. There was only one way to swim, but it's Baltic water. And in October, it's cold. When I came out of the water, I made hardly 10 steps when a Danish policeman asked me where I want to go. So I said, 
I have to go to Copenhagen. And he said, I cannot let you go. I have to get you back to the German gendarmerie unless you want to swim back. And that I did. I went back to Berlin. And there, my life started again the way how it was before. I was desperate. So I sat on a bench which said, no Jews allowed, thinking what my next move should be. When an SS man, a man who worked for Hitler, called me by my first name and asked, Hans, what are you still doing here? Don't you know what we have installed for you? When I looked up, I looked into the eyes of a schoolmate. I told him, I try to get out, but I can't. He said, don't you have a passport? Of course I have no passport. He said, give me two pictures. I said, in two days I will be here. Now came the big question, will he be there? and still will help me as a Jew. When I came two days later, he was there. He had a passport, he had a stapler, he had a stamp. And now I had a real passport in my name, Hans Lohenbach. There was no doubt in my eyes in the moment, I was a piece of home. And because I was a piece of home, I became a human being. One of the things that I wanted to make sure you understood is the reason why the Danes did not allow Hans to come into Denmark was because they had not yet been invaded by Germany. So I suppose at that time, um, they were trying to stay as neutral as they could be. However, it was just a few, a few weeks later that they were invaded by Germany. And once they were, the Danes carried out the most incredible rescue of, of Jews. That's a whole other story. Um, let's go on from here. In late 1938, Hitler had not yet invaded Poland to start the war and begin his final solution which was the official plan to systematically kill all of Europe's Jews. At this time, if you had some money and you could get a ticket out of Germany, you could, st you could still get someone out of a concentration camp. So Hans went to Italy because he now had the passport that his old friend from Lubeck got him. This passport, now he had a passport, he got to Italy and he got the Jewish community in Italy to help him and give him tickets for his mother and father and himself to get to Shanghai, which was the only place that as a Jew he could go at that time. Um, so he was doing everything he could to save himself and his family from the, hit, from the fate that Hitler <coughs> intended for them, but he could not do it alone. In 1938, on the 9th of November, I was on the street in Berlin when Crystal Night, the night of broken glasses, happened. It was my luck, because if I would have been home, I would have been with 30,000 Jewish men who were marched to Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen. The next morning, in the main paper, was the Jews 
had to pay one billion Reichsmark to clean up the mess. This was enough for me. I bought the tickets to Rome. When I came to Rome, Mussolini was in power, and the same rules to that time were in Italy, which were in Germany. I had no problem in Italy because nobody knew that I was Jewish. I looked as Italian <laughs> as anybody else looked to that time. I went to the Jewish organization and asked, please, I need a ticket to get out of Germany and said I can live somewhere. And they told me there were only two places open for Jews to go. One was Shanghai in China, and the other was Tangier in Africa. They gave me a ticket for Shanghai. And this ticket I sent to my mother. And I told her, please try to get the father out of a concentration camp. And believe it or not, when my father, after four years, came home. When he left us, his weight was almost 170 pounds. When he came back, he made it hardly to 70. The Jewish community saw that my father was not able to travel alone. So they gave my mother another ticket for Shanghai. And I followed them. I lived 10 years in Shanghai. It was very primitive. We had no water toilets. It was not an easy life in Shanghai. But it was better than what happened in Europe. The only bad thing is that my mother died a day after the war was over in Shanghai. To be a survivor means that you bring up a family without any relatives. From 35 aunts, uncles, and cousins, only 11 survived the Holocaust. The youngest was three years old. And her brother, seven years, when they went with their mother into the gas chamber. I spoke about the Holocaust, even not with my children. 1956, I met in New Jersey, Elie Wiesel. He made it clear to us that we have to speak about it in order that people will not forget those people who cannot speak for themselves, what had happened to them. My hope is that people will understand that it is important not to hate. Evil does not need your help. I know because I was there when evil was ruling. The choice everybody has 
is to do something or nothing. Evil does not need your help, just your indifference. I'll give you a little background on what happened to Hans in Shanghai. It's actually really interesting. Um, he was he he knew seven languages, if you can believe it. Chinese among them were Chinese and um, Japanese. So he served as a translator. And when the Americans came into um, uh, um, Shanghai, was occupied by the Japanese. And when the American army, the, I believe it was the Seventh Fleet came in. Han served as a translator for General Wiedemeyer, who was right underneath um, um, General MacArthur. Let's see, what else can I tell you? He wanted to go, Hans, um, after the war, you could get a, a, pa a visa to leave. Um, but the only, you, it, it served for two people, so very often two people would get married who really didn't know each other very well. So Hans um, married one of his students so that they could both leave, and um, they wanted to go to Israel, but they were unable to, and they ended up in America where her, her mother was, um, and father, and um, as it happened, um, she became ill and she died. Um, Hans went back to Germany and married somebody else from Germany and had two more children. He had one child with his first wife and then two more with his second wife. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, I think it's also interesting that when Hans came to New York, he didn't have a job. So he was also good at drawing. So he stood on the street corner with pictures that he had drawn, holding them up. And somebody came by and said, you know, we need someone to draw pictures of the shirts that we make to put in magazines and the newspaper. Would you be interested? Um, and Hans said, of course. So he said, well, come with me. I'll introduce you to the people who own the company. So this man brought him to Custom Shirt Makers in New York City. And when he was introduced to the two owners, one of them said to him, Hans, don't you remember me? I was a stock boy in your father's store in Germany. So it, worked, it was an amazing coincidence. Hans worked for the company for 35 years. And then after, when he retired and he moved here, and he spent the rest of his life talking to young people like you, like I said, and to military personnel. Um, let me ask you a few questions. What do you think, what are the lessons that you would take away from the Holocaust, from seeing um, a video like this of a survivor? What do you think are the important lessons? Okay, it's hard. Thank you. Well, that's true. It's always better to say kind words than cruel words. Absolutely. Um, you know, cruel words often lead people to do cruel things. So, what other lessons can you learn? Yes. Speak up when you see something wrong. Speak up, speak out. Absolutely. Anything else? No? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do the right thing even if it's not popular. Right, do the right thing even if it's not popular. Absolutely. Anything else? All right, well, I will tell you a couple things that I think are very important. One of them is, you know, I peop I've, I've heard people say, oh, this country is, before you know it, 
won't be this and it won't be that. And other people say, oh, we're a democracy. Nothing like that can ever happen here. Do you know that Hitler was elected democratically? Germany was a democracy. And it didn't take long for Hitler to turn it in to a despotic country. So never think that, you, that because we are a democracy that we could never lose our freedoms. Always remember the importance of voting and always know who you're voting for. I think also there's a lesson in this, which is, unfortunately, I believe anyways that there is a dark side to human nature and that perhaps we all have inside of us the potential to become like Hitler or to become like the people who followed Hitler. So I think it's important that we always are aware of that potential for darkness in ourselves. And also the outcome of indifference. So I hope you will always choose to act rather than to be indifferent, not to care because it's happening to someone else and not you. All right, I think Rachel, did Rachel come down? Yes. <clears throat> Rachel is going to um, help us now, and we're going to look at some of the things. Hans didn't have a lot of things. He didn't have a suitcase, as you see. All the other survivors had a suitcase. Hans had a briefcase, because as he told you, he spent his days in streetcars, buses, always looking as if you were busy, walking like a businessman. So let's go, we'll look at a few of the things on there. There is a, um, there is a poster. Oh, but before I go off of the suitcase, why don't you Rachel tell them about everything? Oh, so most of the uh, items that might be presented at schools are graphic art. Obviously, what we value is that we're able to keep with them for two precious to them to donate to the program. So these have all been um, artist rendered to, to look like they would have been Hans's. The one item here, though, is, is actually one of Hans's ties because I did not have the pleasure of meeting him, uh, but according to Betsy and others who knew him, he, he just dressed in a suit for the day he died. He was a very formal type of guy. He took a lot of pride in his appearance. And the other things are just to, um, but there's a scarf there and like a businessman might wear. Um, also, the, one, the other thing I want to mention that I've forgotten that I think is very important. There was, I knew, I've been doing this a long time. I'm old, as you see. So I knew survivors who died. We, we had so many survivors here. They're, they're all gone now. We have two left. Um, two left who can speak to, to students. But um, one of the things they always told me, there was no way for anyone to survive without someone who was Christian who helped them. Always remember that. They, they, none of them could have survived on their own. Um, also, Hans had something that almost no one else had he had a military ID. He turned 20 on July 1st, 19, I think it was 1935. You had to go and have your physical and, you know, so that you could go into the German army, as you saw in the video. And um, so he received a military ID. That's because the local communities didn't realize what Hitler was about to do, that he was going to, his plan was to eliminate all the Jews in Europe. So as soon as it came down from headquarters that that was the plan, obviously they couldn't ask Jews to participate in the, in the military. So Hans was one of the few Jews ever to have a, a military ID. And you see the poster there from the Olympics. He, Hans, as, as I think he mentioned, was a translator. Um, here's, here's the can of grease 
that he used. And you know, when we asked Hans, well, why did you wear a suit? How could you cross the Baltic Sea, swim in a suit? He said, well, what was I supposed to do? I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the water in a bathing suit and go around in the middle of October in Denmark in a bathing suit. So um, he actually swam in his suit with his grease lathered all over his body to protect him so he could keep some of the heat in his body. Unfortunately, like you saw, he had to swim back. And that was when he was desperate and he sat on that park bench and his old buddy from Lubeck, his old friend, uh, really saved, there was another righteous gentleman who saved his life. Yes, over two hours. Over four hours. So that's why that grease was so crucial to him as well. I'm trying to think what else. What else is there? Let me ask you, are there any questions you have? You saw the story, and are there any questions? that his mother died the day after the war ended. That was really sad. He had a sister who was three years older. She made it to Sweden. And Hans's father actually followed her to Sweden, but came back to Germany many years later and um, died there, died in Germany. But you know, Hans didn't leave just these things. He left three children. Actually, one was a, his son was a biomedical is a biomedical engineer. His daughter is a physician in New Jersey, and he has another daughter who lives here, who's a social worker. And he so he left these three children and five beautiful grandchildren. Um, I guess that's that's really about all. Can you think of anything else, Rachel? Yeah, there's a couple. I'm not sure if you all have time to come up. that he knew that if it hadn't been him sitting there, he would have taken that person, of course, and brought them to the Gestapo. So he did, he saved Hans's life, and, and, but he never did seek him out because he, he was part of the German regime. He was part of those who made it possible for others, you know, to be, to be killed. So if you don't have any other questions, you've been a wonderful audience. I hope that um, you'll remember some of the things that you heard this morning. And um, always have the courage to speak out and to help someone. Because it could be you one time that needs the help. So thank you very much. Right. 
So um, anyway, uh, you guys really don't have any more questions? I'm kind of surprised, but there we go. There's <laughs> Why did he move here? Because he had a daughter here, and he thought this would be a good place to retire. Um, and he was, he, I wish you knew him. I mean, he always came out and the students loved him. He was just a wonderful person. Um, he went back to Germany, I have to tell you. He went back to Germany a couple times, and the last time he went back, he came back and he said to me, you know, um, Europe is, is just not the place for Jewish people to live. Even, to, even when he returned, he felt that way, that America was the one place that had really made Jewish people feel comfortable and given, given them all the, the rights of um, all their other citizens. So... Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I met him here, um, gosh, how many years ago? It was a long time ago, because I, I was working for the United Jewish Federation since, what, 1989. So it was probably around that time or a little bit later that I met him. And it was Ellie Wiesel, as you saw, that got him to speak. The survivors never spoke about their, about what they went through. And, and I always remember, I mean, most of them did it very reluctantly. It was so hard for them to put themselves back in that frame of mind. And many of them would tell me they, they would not sleep the whole night before they had to appear before the students. And I always felt so bad. And some of them would tell you stories that no matter how many times I heard their story, I would always break down. Some of the stories were, I can't even tell you, they were so horrible. But, um, huh, what, did I answer your question or did I get off topic here? <laughs> any, other any other questions about Hans? No, or about the Holocaust? You all know the time period, obviously, of the Holocaust. Okay. All right. Well, if there are no other questions. Well, no one else thank you again. Um, you very much. It's a great resource. And we appreciate you coming. And you guys are not aware there's a museum in Richmond mm -hmm. dedicated to the Holocaust. If you ever get up there, and um, something to see, something to think about. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do. No. And you know, the fact is that you think, why do we do this? We do this because, you know what, history repeats itself. People forget. And we do the same things again and again. You'd think that after this, there would never be another genocide. And yet, how many genocides have we had in the world since this time? It's just remarkable. So we do it so that you'll try to remember that hatred is just, and Hans said he would do this. I took him out, I believe it was 10 days before he actually passed away. He had told me he would do this to his dying day, and by golly, he almost did, because he felt that hatred was so terrible. Why would you hate somebody? Because they didn't worship the way you worshiped, or they were different color from you, or they were born somewhere different from where you were born? I mean, why? It just makes absolutely no sense. And um, he was dedicated to this mission. I'm only sorry he could not be here instead of me. 